Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of the Global Learning event. I'm so glad you could join us today. We're going to be talking about the opportunities and challenges for economic inclusion in urban areas. We have a wonderful panel who's going to talk through many of these issues with us. But before we start, there's some housekeeping messages that I would like to get out of the way. And my colleagues, Jorge and Claudia, are going to be sharing those messages with you in the chat box as well. So to start, the interpretation for this session is available in English, Spanish, French, and Arabic. Please click on the globe icon at the bottom of your screen and select a language. Please note that everybody must select a language, even if you choose English. We have one audience poll in, in this session, which we'll come to later. But so please, either on your phone, tablet, or a new browser window, please log in to www.menti.com and enter the code that I will give you at the time of, of the poll um, in order to access the poll. If you have any connection issues or trouble selecting your, your preferred language, please let us know in the chat and someone from IT will help you. We also want this to be a lively discussion in the chat box, so please do share your questions, experience, and we will present cross-cutting questions to the panel at the end in the Q&A session. That's it on housekeeping. Let's start the session. Jack, could you throw up my slide, please? Thank you. But before we get to this wonderful panel, I'd like to spend a few minutes framing the issues around economic inclusion in urban areas. Next, please. What we found interesting is that even though traditionally we think of our economic inclusion programs as predominantly rural, actually, when we surveyed these programs um, in, uh, for the State of Economic Inclusion report, we realized that many of these operate already in urban areas, over a third operate in urban areas. And this should not be that surprising because in terms of the context, you see an increasing urbanization across the globe and persistent informality, which means that for many governments, the central policy challenge is really to think about how to create jobs, how to address labor informality, particularly for poor and vulnerable youth and women. And in the past year, this particular policy agenda has taken on great urgency in the context of the ongoing COVID-19 crisis and the huge negative impacts on urban informal workers. The catch though, is that you can't, take ju you can't just take a rural program and transplant that directly into the urban context. And the reason is because the barriers to economic inclusion vary by location. Next, please. We all know yeah. that poor and vulnerable uh, households Donald, Donald. individuals face multiple constraints. In the State of Economic Conclusion report, we think about these constraints at four levels. Now, at the individual and household level, location doesn't matter a great deal. But if you think about higher level constraints at the community, local economy, and institutional level, location plays a hugely important role. So for example, click please. If you think about urban communities, the picture that comes to mind immediately is of congested living and congested informal settlements, insecure housing, among other things. Click please. Even though the local economy in urban areas tends to be very vibrant with access to jobs and markets and financial services, technology, it also tends to have, the, the cost of living tends to be higher in urban areas. Click, please. And finally, at the institutional level, we find that even though urban areas tend to have a very wide range of programs and services, these do not necessarily cater to the needs of the poor and vulnerable. And very often, this group does not feature prominently or even positively in overall urban policy frameworks. Next, please. All of, this, all of which means that if you think about all of these constraints, 
it's really important that we understand how we design and deliver economic inclusion programs appropriately in the urban context. And equally importantly, how we make sure that these programs are embedded in the broader urban policy framework. So these are the issues that we're really going to focus on in today's session. So the first two speakers will be focusing on issues of tailoring design and delivery, thinking about issues around the right target group to focus on, thinking about the package of interventions that's appropriate for this group in the urban context. Issues of delivery, thinking about how to reach these particular selected beneficiaries, how to deliver high intensity and group interventions, um, maybe leverage digital solutions. All of these are really important issues to think about how to adapt programs in urban areas. And our third speaker is going to be, is going to help us take a step back and think about how these programs can be viewed through an urban policy and institutions lens. I'd like, to, that's it from me from the framing. Thank you, um, Jack, if we can move. Before we move to the first speaker, I just realized it's been a very long two days for those of us who've been, those of you who've been with us from the beginning. I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Pooja Datta. I'll be your moderator for this session. And I'm, you know, I, I work with, the, I'm a consultant with the Partnership for Economic Inclusion, PEI, and a co-author of the State of Economic Inclusion Report. Thank you. And I would like us to move to our first presentation, Mr. Dembe. Nadia, who's going to help us, who's going to talk us through the experience in Senegal. Demba is with the government of Senegal. He has been the coordinator of the safety net project for five years. And more recently, he also took responsibility for the Yukunkum pilot in urban Senegal. Demba, we very much look forward to hearing about your experience from the pilot and your plans for scaling it up. Over to you, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Bonjour, merci à merci Pouja, merci à tout le monde. Donc, au niveau du Sénégal, euh, nous avons nous sommes intervenus dans un projet pilote de, au niveau euh, du Sahel, un projet qui s'appelle le projet Yok Kom Kom, qui signifie chez nous dans notre dans notre langage augmenter ses capacités productives. Et ce projet s'est inscrit dans, la, dans le programme de protection sociale adaptative dans le Sahel, qui a été initié en 2014. Ce programme était, a été mis en œuvre dans six pays, dont le Burkina, le Mali, le, la Mauritanie, le Niger, le Sénégal et le Tchad. Et était destiné, l'ensemble des mesures que nous avons mis en œuvre ont été destinées à, aux bénéficiaires de Bourse de Sécurité Familiale, qui est un programme national financé par l'État du Sénégal en faveur de 316 000 ménages. Donc, l'ensemble des bénéficiaires de ce programme de, de Yokkomkom ont été sélectionnés dans le cadre des Bourses de Sécurité Familiale. L'objectif du programme, de, du programme Yokkomkom de l'inclusion financière, l'inclusion financière, était de sensibiliser et développer un plaidoyer auprès des communautés, donc l'ensemble des, des communautés sur les aspirations et normes sociales, encourager l'épargne au niveau des communautés, réaliser des formations et l'encadrement de coaching des bénéficiaires des menaces ciblées et impulser des activités productives avec le droit d'une subvention productive. Slide. Dans le, sur le plan institutionnel, le projet a été monté avec plusieurs acteurs. Dans le gouvernement, avec l'intermédiaire du programme du, de la délégation générale de la protection sociale et de la solidarité nationale, le, 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 programme le projet d'appui aux filets sociaux, qui est un projet financé par la Banque mondiale, la Banque mondiale qui a assuré l'appui technique du programme, les ONG qui ont été recrutées au niveau local pour la mise en œuvre des activités de terrain, des cabinets privés 
pour faire les travaux, pour faire la formation des, et des agents de terrain et le suivi de la post-formation. Et nous avons sélectionné un opérateur de paiement pour les transferts monétaires. L'opérateur de paiement, euh, le, le projet a été mis en œuvre dans quatre régions, au niveau urbain et en milieu urbain, et a concerné 14 500 bénéficiaires. Et le répondant clé, c'est-à-dire la personne qui était sélectionnée pour euh, venir représenter le ménage, nous avions ciblé en priorité les femmes, les jeunes femmes de, entre 18 et 45 ans. Slide. Les mesures d'accompagnement qui ont été mises en œuvre lors de la, de la mise en œuvre de cette activité ont été les, la sensibilisation communautaire, la, qui, était, qui, concerne, qui concernait surtout la projection de vidéos de success story de couples et de ménages qui ont réussi avec euh, les, cette activité, la formation de groupes et de coaching, les réunions et les fonctionnements des, des associations villageoises d'épargne euh, et de crédit, des ateliers de formation en compétences de vie et des formations en micro-entreprise et en entrepreneuriat. Et à la fin, nous avons donné une subvention de 150 000 francs CFA qui équivaut à environ à 300 dollars. Slide. Les résultats auxquels nous avons abouti à partir de ces différentes activités. Nous avons pu constater une stimulation des investissements et la diversification et la diversification des activités génératrices de revenus. La quasi-totalité des bénéficiaires ont développé une activité génératrice de revenus et une importante mobilisation financière a été constatée au niveau surtout des des, 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 des ASEC. Nous avons fait, nous avons constaté un développement des mécanismes de financement de proximité et la, préparation, et la pratique de l'épargne grâce à la mise en place des, des associations villageoises d'épargne et de crédit. Nous avons aussi constaté une amélioration du bien-être et la sécurité alimentaire, et plus de confort psychosociétal et de, et de cohésion sociale, surtout les femmes qui ont été mieux intégrées dans la société. Et nous avons constaté aussi une stimulation des aspirations et l'autonomie économique des femmes qui ont surtout été privilégiées dans le cadre de ce programme. Les facteurs qui ont facilité la mise en œuvre de ce programme, slide, sont les, la répartition du travail, la répartition du travail entre le gouvernement, les ONG et les cabinets privés, L'innovation et le changement dans le mode d'accompagnement. Avant, on faisait juste un accompagnement des populations. Maintenant, on a, on a dans, ce cadre, dans le cadre de ce pilote, fait du coaching individuel et du coaching de groupe. Nous avons réadapté les contenus et ajusté les contenus par rapport à ce qu'on faisait avant en faisant des traductions du support en langue locale, l'utilisation de vidéos et d'images. Et les facteurs facilitant aussi, quand il s'agit de, qui sont spécifiquement liés au milieu urbain, c'est surtout la proximité des lieux des activités et domiciles des bénéficiaires. Là, il y a une forte concentration en milieu urbain. Une meilleure implication des leaders communautaires et des autorités locales, donc qui facilite la mobilisation des bénéficiaires. Mais ça, c'est surtout vrai en périurbain, en, en milieu purement, plus c'est urbanisé, plus la, la mobilisation est difficile. Une bonne compréhension des formations due à, une me, à un meilleur niveau d'instruction et de scolarisation des bénéficiaires. Slide. Au niveau des défis, nous avons le choix de la tranche d'âge par rapport à ce, les options qui avaient été retenues dans le cadre du projet, 
Le choix de la tranche d'âge du membre du ménage qui doit représenter le ménage a été un problème qu'il faut, qu faut résoudre. L'appui à la diversification des activités génératrices de revenus parce que les ménages, tous les ménages font le plus simple, c'est-à-dire font du, la presse totalité font du commerce. On aimerait que les activités soient le plus diversifiées. La prise en compte des variables religieuses et culturelles dans la, dans la mise en œuvre du projet. Le suivi optimum de la performance et du contrôle de qualité, dans, surtout dans le, dans le suivi évaluation et le contrôle de la qualité de, de la mise en œuvre par les acteurs, par les acteurs de terrain. Les, les limites spécifiquement liées au milieu urbain, on se rend compte qu'il y a un fréquent déménagement et une faible disponibilité et grande mobilité des bénéficiaires. Il y a, une manque, il y a un manque d'adaptabilité du fonctionnement de certaines activités dues à la, à la promiscuité. Là, nous avions voulu travailler surtout avec les mairies, les communautés et collectivités locales pour la mise à disposition d'espaces de formation. Malheureusement, nous avons, malheureusement, certaines collectivités locales n'ont pas joué le jeu. Donc, il y a eu la formation qui a duré en longueur, plus longue que, que prévu. Et il y, a une, il y a une difficulté dans la délimitation des quartiers. Vous savez, la perception que la personne a de là où il habite, et la réalité, la limite de son quartier n'est pas déterminée. Alors que les paquets étaient dessinés par quartier. Right. Aujourd'hui, avec le projet, nous pensons pouvoir faire une mise à l'échelle. C'est à partir de cette année. qui va se baser sur l'évaluation d'impact multi-pays pour mesurer l'efficacité et déterminer le contenu optimum des mesures d'accompagnement productif à mettre en œuvre. Une évaluation qualitative du processus qui a déjà eu lieu et sur lequel nous avons fait l'atelier collaboratif avec toutes les parties prenantes. Et nous espérons que cette année, nous pourrons faire 30 000 ménages, même 45 000 dont 10 000 en milieu rural et 35 000 peut-être en milieu urbain. Et, tout, et le, chaque cycle de formation, d'encadrement de durera 18 mois. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Demba. That was a fascinating presentation and just hearing about the experience of this pilot in, in, in urban Senegal, I think the insights are extremely rich in terms of how you design the program and the delivery mechanism to fit the urban context. But also I think what was interesting to hear was the challenges that you faced, despite those efforts, the, the challenges that the urban context still threw at you in terms of how you deliver this program, I think that's going to be uh, very of great interest to the participants in this room. Also, very happy to hear about your scale up plans and uh, to know that this program is going to then be moving out to more urban areas and to rural areas. And it'll be very interesting to hear from you on what your thoughts about the design for the rural scaled up version versus the urban scaled up version. Thank you, Demba. Moving to our next speaker, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Lauren Whitehead. Lauren is the Director of Technical Assistance for BRAC's Ultra Poor Graduation Initiative. Um, Lauren will be sharing her experience working with many governments on including urban uh, economic inclusion programs in urban areas. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Pooja. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, great, thank you. you. Okay, 
Wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone, and lovely to virtually meet everyone for this morning. Um, I will go ahead and follow on to the wise words that we've heard already from Pooja and the example that was shared by Demba to talk a little bit more specifically around um, key considerations in designing for the urban context. Um, and we specifically focus on the terminology of designing for the urban context rather than adapting for the urban context, as Pooja mentioned earlier, for the unique constraints, challenges, and opportunities that are faced in urban environments. And so I'll speak a little bit more to that as we go along. So to begin with, I, I think it's important just to set the context that we're looking at in the wake of COVID-19, recognizing that the pandemic has disproportionately exacerbated existing economic shocks um, faced by people in both rural and urban poverty. Currently, we're witnessing significant impacts in terms of vast unemployment, underemployment, and this is particularly um, prevalent among those in the informal sector, in the informal economy. In urban areas, as many of you may know, anywhere between 50 to 80 percent of employment in many of the countries where we work can be informal. And as a result of that, and due to the pandemic, workers are currently surviving on reduced daily wages and living in very dense neighborhoods, often with unreliable access to very basic services, including healthcare, which is obviously important during a pandemic. We've also seen the rise of what has now been termed the new poor. Um, and according to the World Bank's Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report in 2020, these are individuals whose income falls below $1.90 per day, but who are also more likely in the case of urban context to be urban, better educated, and less likely to work in agriculture than those living in extreme poverty before COVID-19. So this means we are actually seeing a shift in the demographic around those who've been most impacted by the pandemic and therefore has necessitated this rise in a focus on urban poor populations, um, perhaps even more so than rural populations previously. But that's not to say that rural areas have not been affected by these trends in urban areas. Many would recognize the swell of reverse migration that's been happening for the last year from urban centers to rural environments, largely due to the health consequences of the pandemic and of course the loss of jobs and any form of um, piecemeal labor in cities that was taking place previously. One really strong example of this is unfortunately in India where currently as many of you may know, around one out of three of the worldwide cases of COVID can now be found, um, which is currently devastating the country with the second wave. And prior to this, there was a significant wave of uh, reverse migration from urban areas to rural areas, which unfortunately helped spread the, the pandemic faster than in other contexts. India is not alone in this regard, as there are many countries that are experiencing the very same. Though the graduation approach itself originated in rural environments, the approach is very adaptable to urban contexts, and as Pooja mentioned earlier, is already being utilized in urban contexts in many places around the world currently. And again, the reason why that is, is because graduation at its core, when we think about the four foundational pillars of graduation in social protection, in livelihoods promotion, social empowerment, financial inclusion, all of those work together to restore access to livelihood opportunities and build resilience to economic shocks. And that is universal, whether or not households are based in rural areas or in urban areas in particular. So let's just focus on one particular example to start with. Um, so I'll start with the context of Bangladesh and then expand on some examples from other contexts where urban graduation programs are operating or other economic inclusion programs. So before COVID-19 struck, around 40% of Dhaka's population lived in urban slums. Um, and that was a representation of about 20% of the population on estimate um, that were considered to be poor living in urban environments, um, specifically in large cities such as Dhaka. This is what actually prompted BRAC to start its first urban graduation pilot back in 2020, excuse me, in 2010. Um, and that urban pilot specifically was to respond to this growing need of individuals who had moved to urban contexts primarily from rural contexts and were not able to have their basic needs met, were not able to link into the market appropriately, even if the reason for them moving was previously because of economic migration for a job. Currently in Bangladesh, the setting and um, the urban setting is quite dire. Lockdowns are driving high, high degrees of food insecurity. Migration away from urban centers like Dhaka, we're increasing 
increasingly informal work is quite hard to come by. So in 2020, approximately 10 years after our initial urban pilot, BRAC decided to collaborate between our ultra poor graduation program and our urban program to focus on strategizing the redesign of a graduation pilot for urban areas specifically. Currently, this redesign is going to start off with a pilot of 5,000 participants with the anticipation to scale, of course, um, in various urban settings. Because it's being adapted to urban environments, we're seeing differences in robust targeting methods that are now being applied because of the difficulties of identifying urban populations that may be interspersed, um, urban poor populations that may be interspersed within the general population. Being able to identify both physical asset and cash-based livelihood options in some cases, even being able to top up existing livelihoods, such as petty trade that people may have had access to, but were struggling livelihoods because of COVID-19, um, which this is much more common in urban areas than you'll see in rural areas. Very often people are engaged in some sort of side business to earn kind, some kind of income. Um, and then also focusing on people living with disabilities and an increasing population with disabilities that's been left behind in urban areas. So all of this working together to create a very highly contextualized um, program and approach. In addition to this, BRAC is also layering in a focus on climate resilience as it pertains to urban populations, collaborating with KFW, which is a German development bank currently. Um, so there's sort of many different factors that are being considered in the pilot. But again, the focus here is on designing for the urban context rather than simply adapting something that was applied to rural context into the urban context. So understanding and doing a proper needs assessment for that urban population specifically. In addition to this urban graduation pilot redesign, BRAC is also separately developing an emergency 2021-2022 economic recovery strategy. And that economic recovery strategy will reach outside of households that are in extreme and ultra poverty to include the needs of this broader base of who might be considered the new poor. Um, and BRAC will also be expanding its graduation programs nationwide to 35 districts around the country as a means of supporting those who've been most impacted by the pandemic. So on this next slide, I wanted to focus more generally on what we might consider to be some common characteristics of urban, urban poverty and how we go about utilizing those characteristics for targeting this population. So as I mentioned before, sometimes it can be more difficult to target urban populations that might be not necessarily concentrated if you're looking at populations living outside of slums. So a slum might be a concentration of individuals, but in urban contexts, many individuals might be scattered, might be dispersed amongst the larger population due to the driving factor, which brings many to urban areas, which is economic migration. So though there are no, by no means universal characteristics of urban, urban poverty graduation programs and the individuals they target, there are some commonalities that we seem we tend to see. For example, high transients. There's high degree of, as I mentioned, rural migration in search of economic opportunities. This high mobility is something that Demba also mentioned as being a constraint and a challenge in the in the context in Senegal. There's also high reliance on informal work. As I was mentioning, 50 to 80% of urban populations in many developing countries do engage in informal work, whether it's seasonal labor, some kind of daily wage labor, domestic service, or even begging in, many case, in some cases. There's a high concentration in urban slums in certain environments, and then also widespread dispersion in others. In those urban slums, you might have illegal settlements or shanty towns, which adds to further um, further disruption around stable housing and access to stable housing as many of these populations may be scattered may be forced to be scattered may be forced to be displaced um, or evicted because of the nature of illegal tenements illegal settlements that that sometimes do pop up there's also very limited social cohesion among the groups typically and this is largely because of a high degree of anonymity in urban environments um, because of fragmented community networks and social capital that has been lost or significantly lowered by migration so if you think about a population that may have lived or even just a household that may have lived in a rural area may have had strong ties to family to community and so forth and then they migrate to an urban area and they they start to live in that urban context but don't necessarily have any of those connections which means they've lost that network of resources that they might have previously previously had. Um, 
contrary to common belief, there's often very low access to social services. And what we mean by this is access to things such as sanitation and hygiene, such as clean drinking water, I already mentioned shelter and, and stable housing. And so what this means, even electricity, for example, what this means is that there are high degrees of illegal pilfering and tapping of some of these services so that households are able to access them, which might give the appearance of access to stable services, but in reality, they're not. It's quite precarious, and at any time they could lose access to these. Um, and many times this is not assumed because most people think that in urban areas these are relatively in abundance, um, but that is quite difficult for many urban populations we encounter in graduation programs. And in addition, the last item I'll mention here is that one benefit in urban context might be considered the dynamic market environment and access to that dynamic market environment which often drives individuals to come to ur urban areas and therefore that might mean they're able to have higher willingness to take risks because the gains of taking those risks financially um, economically speaking might be quite high for them if they engage in certain enterprises or certain forms of employment. Um, you might also find that these populations have higher degrees of education, slightly higher, slightly higher skills base and training experience at times than rural populations. And some of this may have led to their drive to urban environments. So recognizing that some of these characteristics, while difficult, are those that you would encounter during doing an assessment of an urban population. There are opportunities amidst the challenges as well for this context. So what does this look like then when we're actually designing for graduation in these urban contexts? While the delivery of the graduation interventions and the shape of some of those interventions might change in economic inclusion programs um, in urban areas, we have found, particularly with BRAC, that working with our partners, the four foundational pillars of graduation do not necessarily change. Um, and that is because, again, those four pillars work together in an intertwined fashion to ensure that all of the core needs of a household are met so that they're able to move forward in this upward trajectory from poverty. So again, not just adjusting to a rural context, but thinking with the mindset of how do we approach the urban context with a fresh perspective around design. Some differences you might see from rural programs include in livelihoods promotion, whereby the livelihoods transfer might take many different forms. Pooja mentioned this as well. Um, you might see in-kind assets, you might see cash assets that are provided, you might see linkages to wage employment pathways or to vocational training. So there's a broader set of, of uh, livelihoods opportunities that you tend to see in urban environments. And again, that's because of the dynamism of the market and the opportunities that are available. Localized market assessments, often engage particular employers or vendors in consultation to see, again, what are some potential wage pathways, wage employment pathways for households, what are some vibrant market opportunities that they can engage in sustainably. Technical and business management training is often tiered to different segmented levels. And what that means is, again, because we're seeing a population that may have slightly higher skills base um, and slightly more diverse or heterogeneous mix of skills, education, background, um, training that is provided for these individuals really does have to be tailored and targeted to different segmented levels. When we're thinking about social protection, again, I had mentioned the linkage to government social protection schemes or social services, um, including horizontal expansion. I think something that COVID-19 has made very clear for many of us working in this space is that many of the social protection schemes that are available in countries have not previously been extended to urban populations or have been done so in a patchier, um, less consistent fashion. And so the widespread horizontal expansion of social protection schemes is exceedingly important for reaching this population as systematically as reaching rural populations. Um, access to reliable sanitation and basic hygiene services I've mentioned and provision of stable and secure housing. In terms of financial inclusion, um, we're seeing greater access to financial literacy training that does focus on how to engage with a dynamic market. Um, for example, thinking about diversification earlier than in many rural contexts because that's possible to think about transitioning businesses and growing businesses fast, faster, being able to even access microloans as a business might grow faster in urban areas, for example. Linkages and creations of savings groups. Um, Pooja also mentioned thinking about digital delivery and digital financial services is included as a part of that. So access to digital banking me um, mechanisms, access to individual bank accounts and so forth uh, might be more widespread in the urban context. Um, and then of course, social empowerment. Uh, so something that Demba had mentioned was thinking about 
the social ties within a community and the fact that if you have a higher degree of transience migration, you might not have populations that know each other quite as well or have formed those community ties and bonds. So graduation programs in urban contexts focus heavily on community mobilization to make sure that there's some sort of even self-governing structure for populations to be able to access together, to bring them together, to focus on advocating for their rights. Linkage, linkages to existing community groups where these do already take place. Um, and then targeting some of the coaching activities a bit differently, not only in the content delivery, but also even in the timing and structure. Um, so again, Demba mentioned in Senegal, actually being able to bring the coaching to households more easily, because we know that it can be quite difficult to move across urban landscapes to be able to access um, training opportunities, coaching, and so forth recognizing that in urban contexts, households are usually quite busy because they're traveling further to go back and forth to maybe multiple jobs and so forth. So really thinking critically about how the timing of certain supports takes place um, and the timing of things like coaching activities and when and where a coach visits you. In an urban context, often coaches don't just visit you at your home, as you might see in a rural context, they might actually come and visit you at your place of work because that's easier for you to meet with them and so forth. Um, and then of course, group-based coaching, which has many, many benefits, including including more organization across peer groups, bringing them together and strengthening that network of social capital. And so on this last slide here, um, I just wanted to show a few examples of what a refined design process might look like in an urban context. Um, thinking again along the dimensions of these four pillars and some country examples to share with you. So for example, in livelihoods promotion where we're focusing on wage and income generating opportunities, we found through vulnerability assessments that urban populations are heavily reliant on wage labor within the city limits. Um, many of them may be skilled, basically skilled, unskilled, lowly skilled, it's, a, it's quite a variety and a mix. So in Uganda, for example, when BRAC was implementing the youth graduation pilot, we had a strong focus on skills-based and skills-tailored vocational training um, on electrical work, on mobile phone repair, motorcycle repair, hospitality, and even a greater focus on things such as apprenticeships, which would bring people into, um, into opportunities whereby thereafter they would have a dedicated wage employment path to follow. When we think about social protection, access to basic services, um, again, those though these populations may be in urban environments where social services are available, where basic services are available, their lack of visibility might mean they don't have sufficient or adequate access to these and operate through workarounds like pilfering access to electricity or clean water, for example. So in Tamil Nadu, we're working with the Tamil Nadu Slum Clearance Board to ensure that there's increased access to things such as sanitation services to improve health and hygiene outcomes for households that have been resettled from urban slums um, to different areas on the outskirts of certain cities. And this is to ensure that those services that they should have had access to previously but may not have had are one of the key features, one of the key design and graduation intervention features for the population. When we think about financial inclusion and access to, which is an access to means of growing your income, preparing for future shocks, for example, we recognize something very particular among urban populations that you don't tend to see as frequently in rural populations, though this is not impossible, of course, but many urban households actually struggle with very high rates of indebtedness. And this is due to relatively high costs of actually living and operating in urban environments. So even if they might not have access to a formal or an informal savings mechanism, it varies quite often. Um, they might not have access to utilize some of those and therefore might rely on predatory lending, re might rely on um, high degree of accessing loans to meet even their most basic needs. And some of those barriers to entry for accessing more sustainable and suitable financial services can include lack of access to sufficient identification and IDs to be able to access it, lack of access to sufficient collateral, um, no fixed address, for example, which means that even though they're in an area where financial services, safer financial services might abound, they might not be able to take advantage of those. So for example, in the Philippines, program participants were taught how to spot and avoid aggressive lending programs and predators, for example, loan sharks, um, which was pushed on them through financial literacy training and access to micro savings accounts so that they could prevent a future need for indebtedness. And then the program actually working with the government and the Asian Development Bank, we were able to go one step further and help identify graduation criteria that pointed to a reduction in debt, in debt 
a reduction in indebtedness for these populations as well. And then the last element to mention here is around social empowerment, which refers to the robust social messaging, coaching, and so forth in urban contexts, which is very important to build back that social capital that may have been lost for populations. Recognizing that transient that transient nature of the populations, coaches promote social messaging and linkages or referrals, as Pooja was mentioning, that foster more connections with local power structures, with local government agencies and local municipal administrations, which they might not have access to and might not have a voice in those spaces, as you might see more frequently in, urban, in rural populations that already have some sort of collectivization among the community. So for example, in Rwanda, coaches are drawn from volunteer caseworkers who are seen as peer role models models in the context there and within their community. And by using these peer role models um, and helping those peer role models create referrals and linkages to local government resources, we're strengthening social ties among individuals in the community, but also building a bridge for them to be able to advocate for their needs and their rights. Um, so while there are many, many similarities between graduation programs in rural and urban contexts, designing for urban contexts really requires approaching both assessment and design with a critical lens that's attuned to the unique barriers and challenges posed by the urban context, rather than sim simply tweaking or modifying the rural approach to an urban context. So to this end, it's very critical for graduation implementers and policymakers alike to partner with urban development and urban planning agencies to ensure appropriately tailored and ultimately successful graduation programs or other economic inclusion programs in these contexts. So thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and very much look forward to Judy's presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was fantastic. Really uh, a troll through multiple contexts um, and the experience of adapting programs, the design and delivery of programs in, in an urban context in four different, five different um, contexts. What I found most interesting about Lauren's presentation was the clear, very tight link between a needs assessment, which is very specific to the context, and really thinking, using that to think about what the target group needed to be and what the components needed to be to address the barriers faced by the target group. And that came through whether it was Bangladesh, Rwanda, the Philippines, India, or Uganda. And the other aspect that I found most interesting about your presentation, Lauren, was in Bangladesh, you started in 2010. Um, there was an urban pilot already, so there was a lot of learning that's gone into the issues that need to be addressed. Um, and the experience of these other countries then has provided a lot of rich insights on how con context in terms of a different economy and culture can also make a difference. So it was, it was fascinating to hear all of that. Thank you. I'd like to... I mean, I want to emphasize also the fact that both Demba for Senegal and Lauren for multiple countries pointed to very similar sets of challenges in delivering their programs. Um, and it, it was interesting for me to hear how common some of those challenges were, but I'd like to now turn this over to, to you in the audience and, and hear from you what you found the most challenging aspect of designing and delivering urban programs that you have experienced or anticipate in your programs. Uh, can we have the menti poll up please thank you so if if you could go to www.menti.com and use the code 69396940 just type in that code and you'll be able to respond to this question and the question is what was the most challenging aspect of designing and delivering urban programs that you have experienced in your own programs or anticipate choose as many options as apply. And some of you are already um, picking the options. One, targeting poor and vulnerable households. Two, targeting the new poor population. Three, supporting a transient population. Four, ensuring access to basic services like sanitation, water, housing. Five, identifying viable market opportunities for sustainable urban livelihoods. Six, transitioning from informal to formal wage employment pathways, seven, providing access to applicable financial services, eight, integrating coaching that meets the needs and lifestyle of urban households, nine, 
tailoring training content and delivery to urban participants. 10, dealing with low take up or high program dropout. And 11, working with local, local uh, urban local governments. I'll give you a few minutes to, um, to respond, but clearly there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of action. So far, most of you identify targeting the new poor population as the critical challenge, which is not surprising given the, the, the world that we're living in now. The second, there's a tie on second place with targeting poor and vulnerable populations to start with and identifying viable market opportunities for sustainable urban livelihoods. These seem to be the top issues, but a very close third is Ah, there's still there's still some back and forth. So the other really important challenge that you, you are highlighting is integrating coaching that meets the needs and lifestyles of urban livelihoods. So it really seems to be about targeting. That seems to be a really big issue. Thinking about the right livelihood options and identifying market opportunities for these seems to be another big challenge and really thinking about how to deliver coaching in a way that really works for urban participants. This is what we're hearing back from you in terms of the biggest challenges of delivering um, programs in urban areas. I think it's interesting to hear all of these. I would like to focus on the last code that we had, and some of you do point to working with urban local governments as, as a challenge in your experience or you anticipate this challenge. So I'd like to take a step back here and just reflect on this last challenge um, and, and, and ask Judy to talk us through the issue of how do we effectively work with urban local governments and how do we embed economic inclusion in urban policy frameworks. So our third speaker, Judy has extensive regional experience and urban development across the world. She is the she co-leads the World Bank's Global Solutions Group on Urban Poverty, Inclusive Cities and Housing. So over to you, Judy. Look forward to hearing your messages. Thank you. Sorry, thanks. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay, and can you see my screen? Yes, but uh, you need to put it on presentation mode. There we go. Is that working? Uh, we can see the notes. Okay. If you, if you go display settings. Yeah. And then swap presenter view and slide. There we go. Is that working now? Okay, great. All right, sorry, thanks. We were commenting that, yeah, Zoom. We all use different platforms anyway. Thank you so much. Um, I'm truly delighted to be part of this discussion and um, really enjoyed the two presentations we just heard. Um, I think they're spot on in there, um, especially some of the things that Lauren presented are programs that I can remember from many years ago. And it's really nice to see how they've adapted. Um, I, I can remember conversations in Bangladesh like 15 years ago when I was working there about how, uh, so I was working on urban poverty and how to get some of these um, programs to adapt in urban areas. So it's great to see some of the, the current thinking. So I'm going to take a slightly different perspective here and kind of zoom in on the issues from a city lens, uh, so slightly different. So um, we know that the role of cities uh, in job creation is super important. Um, it's, it's that you know densification of people and resources that helps to drive economic growth, and we have lots of evidence from around the world about the dynamics. Um, it has to do with uh, interactions between firms and workers, um, the better matching of, of workers to specific, and firms to specific skills needs. Um, there are lower costs of production, more diversity in innovation, and higher productivity in cities. And uh, the proximity of different firms can help to lower the cost of, of transporting goods and services. Uh, but we also know that there are lots of challenges in cities. 
So we do know, uh, we heard a little bit about slums. There's also challenges around congestion, which can put a big drag on the urban economy. Uh, we know about problems of pollution and lots of informality. So lots of people come to cities looking for formal jobs and end up in the informal sector. And some of the causes, there are many, many causes here, but some of them have to do with uh, land markets, dysfunctional land markets. So um, land is not used in an efficient way. And so you have a lot of, especially for fast growing cities where um, there wasn't a good base of urban planning. So you have a lot of haphazard development and um, again, this contributes to some of the challenges. You have fragmented product markets, uh, overall city planning, land use planning and implementation tend to be weak. There um, are some places where we've learned about the importance of that. If you look at a place like Singapore, you know how, how important urban planning can be, but most cities in the developing world haven't uh, been able to achieve that. Uh, also challenges with finance, especially at the municipal level, many, many cities struggle with raising enough revenue to be able to invest in the cities and then inequitable policies. And that's especially important when we think about the urban poor. So I don't need to repeat because Lauren gave us a, a great uh, overview about the challenges uh, of the urban poor. Uh, we know there's you know, over a billion people living in slums and some of those conditions can be quite dire. Um, and it's not only from living conditions perspective, but also from an economic perspective. So lots of people work from home. And if you don't have consistent access to water, sanitation, to electricity, then it's very difficult to do your work. Uh, also things like roads to get goods in and out. Um, we, we know there's also a lot of risks from natural hazards and health. And we saw that through COVID. In fact, uh, we know indeed, as, as was mentioned by Lauren, about the impacts of COVID on slums. They really have been hotspots around the world. So now looking a little bit more uh, forward, what can cities do to foster job creation? So we think about this in two slices. One are place-based policies, and that's really uh, where I think urbanists come in. Uh, we think about cities and the built environment, but also people-based policies. And it's really uh, needs to be both. It's not one or the other. So some of the programs we just heard about, I think were more on the people-based policies, um, but there's a lot of things that cities can do to help foster job creation. So the first bucket is around institutions and regulations. So there's a host of things about taxing, licensing, um, zoning, um, promotion and branding. A lot of cities are thinking about how do they promote and brand their cities so that they can attract private sector investments. And things around public safety, super important to have a safe environment to foster businesses. The second bucket is around infrastructure and land. So, you know, couldn't be more important to make sure that you have solid basic infrastructure and services, uh, you know, again, whether it's roads, water and sanitation, solid waste management, so that your uh, drains don't get clogged every time it rains, um, having open space. And this is super important, especially for uh, informal vendors, having spaces where they can go to, to sell their products, um, making sure that markets operate in a sanitary way, having um, subsidized land for certain kinds of businesses and zoning laws. And then more on the people-based side, you have things around skills and innovations and cities do plenty. Many of the programs are national level, but you also have local level programs that focus on education and training um, that can help youth and women uh, targeting special groups. Um, there's lots of excellent examples. And then enterprise support and innovation. So um, again, there's a lot of programs at city level for investment facilitation. Um, you have things like one-stop shops, marketing and business information. So a lot, lot can happen. And just to, you know, I like this picture because though it seems to be New York, what I like about it is that, you know, it just shows you how 
and, and we've all seen it through COVID, how you know, cities have adapted to open up space so that um, you know, different uh, private sector businesses can adapt to specific needs. And we've seen that in, in many, many different uh, environments. So this slide, uh, what I wanted to show you here is that, um, so it's, this is all in the context of other policies that are happening. So we're calling this the mayor's wedge. So this is what cities do, the things that I just mentioned. Um, and this comes from a competitive cities framework that we developed. But uh, there's also a role for national governments and for the private sector. And I won't go through them all, uh, but it just gives you a sense that, you know, we're really looking at this from the urban lens. And it's very important that cities can work both across sectors, uh, so different agencies can work together on these issues, but also work with different levels of government. Now, when we focus in on the urban poor um, and what we can do to promote economic inclusion, I, I, Drawing on this framework that we've used now in a number of studies, uh, looking at uh, how to foster inclusive cities. So there's three elements that really go into it. The first is uh, spatial inclusion. That's around land, housing, and services for all. We also have economic inclusion, so that's the job opportunities, but also about building resilience so that if there is a shock, people have uh, a way to uh, something to fall back on and a way to, to resume uh, after the shock. And then finally, social inclusion. And this has to do with improving local governance and making sure that people have a voice and reaching those that are marginalized. What's really important here is to note that um, it's not an either or. So to have really an inclusive cities, you sort of need all three of these components and they come together in many, many different ways. Um, and ultimately, you're trying to get to the center of that uh, diagram where you know, your programs and policies are addressing all three. So um, just to sort of elaborate a tiny bit more on this, um, we have um, you know, different kinds of interventions and investments, both at the policy and programmatic level that can be targeted to address uh, issues of economic, spatial, and social inclusion for the urban poor and marginalized groups. Um, I won't go through them all because I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, but you know, there are things that are really important about urban transport, information systems, um, land rights, uh, tenure security, um, that all come together uh, to create a more inclusive city. So just really wanted to finish up with a few quick examples about the kinds of interventions that cities can do to foster this inclusive cities approach. So again, on the context of what cities already do to create jobs, but there are certain um, activities we know that uh, can be more conducive for informal employment and low skilled laborers. So, how can cities help to ensure that these uh, groups are being reached in the context of urban work that we would need to have happen anyway? And these are drawn from World Bank projects, but um, you know, in, carried out in collaboration with cities. So the first is around enhancing public spaces and markets. So we do a lot of investments to um, make sure there's running water and there's uh, place for the solid waste management and that the, especially during COVID we've seen some really interesting examples about how to adapt so that they could do social distancing in a given space whether it was extending hours or um, you know different different kinds of uh, approaches. Uh, affordable transport systems so this is super important to allow people to be able to get to jobs get to central business districts or wherever the jobs are because we know that often the urban poor are not living near near the centers of cities. Um, slum upgrading programs. So this is a huge way to improve not only living conditions for people, but also business opportunities. And I've seen a lot of programs. It's not just about the built environment, but it's also about 
including training programs within the context of slum operating programs and um, getting people to talk about the design of their communities so that they can have open space and street lighting so that they can uh, have their businesses stay open a little bit later and um, people have a place to go to, to operate uh, their small businesses. Solid waste management. So a lot of informal workers work in the sector and through some of our programs, we're able to adapt them so that uh, workers have better working conditions. They have access to social protection. Um, they've been able to form groups uh, so that their, their working, overall working conditions are better and in, over time have become formalized. So we have some really nice examples with that. Um, urban infrastructure that also uses labor intensive public work. So I think this group probably would know a lot about labor intensive works programs, but I can say that um, for us, we have quickly adapted with COVID to try to transform some of the things that we do anyway, um, to make them more labor intensive and find ways to uh, add a little bit more of an economic inclusion lens and hire um, people that may not have other opportunities. And then finally, um, there, there's some interesting work in uh, Karachi happening. And uh, I, I like to mention this because it's around enhancing public spaces. And um, so it's a, obviously a very complex city and we were trying to find an entry point where it would be a win-win for the city. And so we started with the public spaces to allow some improvement so that again, for people to be able to come in and use that space um, for, you know, entertainment, enjoyment, but also for small businesses. And then once we were able to build that credibility with um, the communities and with local governments and the dialogue, we were able to then move on to some of the more complex issues. So let me stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judy. I was, uh, that was a very nice complimentary perspective to the one that we as practitioners typically take. So it, for me, at least, it really helps to step back and see how to come at this from an urban policy lens. We don't have a lot of time and there've been lots of questions in the Q&A. Lauren, thank you for, for answering many of the specific questions in the chat box. Um, there were a bunch of questions around targeting, a bunch of questions around training, the components um, to be offered, the duration of these programs, what I would, and we will share some links in the chat box where you can go and look at the Senegal experience and the BRAC experience a little bit more closely to get some answers. What I want to focus on now is one question that was raised that really goes to the core issue. And this is, um, I forget who, who asked this question, I'm sorry. It says, my program has been working in a rural context since 2014 and will be launched in an urban and peri-urban context. So what are the conditions for successful economic inclusion in urban areas? What are the mistakes to avoid? Um, can I turn to, uh, to Demba and then to Lauren and, and then to Judy? Demba, first to you. Thank you. Uh, and sorry, if, if uh, in the interest of time, could I please ask you to keep your responses to a minute so we might have time for another question? Thank you. Demba? Oh, oui, bonjour. Vous m'entendez? Yes, we hear you. OK, thank you. Alors, pour, pour ce qui est de la question concernant le, les erreurs à ne pas connaître, commettre pour les activités dans le cadre du au niveau, au niveau urbain, c'est surtout on, les choses les plus difficiles, c'est le, le ciblage le ciblage en milieu urbain, l'espace pour faire l'ensemble des activités, et surtout dans nos pays africains, parce que je connais bien le Burkina, c'est la même chose que le Sénégal, nous avons les problèmes de délimitation des quartiers. Nous, nous avions fait plusieurs paquets où quand vous êtes dans un quartier, vous pouvez avoir un capital, quand vous êtes dans un autre quartier, vous n'avez pas de capital, vous avez un capital social, vous avez un paquet social. Donc, une rue peut séparer les deux Les, les deux paquets de telle sorte que votre voisin a de l'argent, vous, vous n'en avez pas. Bon, ça crée des tensions, etc. 
Après, le plus difficile, encore une fois, c'est le suivi et l'évaluation des activités. Le suivi de terrain et la qualité des, des, des compétences que l'on veut amener au niveau terrain. C'est très difficile pour nous au niveau central parce qu'il faut aller, il faut, il faut le, le suivre et ce n'est jamais évident parce que en termes de capacité, c'est difficile. Nous sous-traitons à des ONG. Après, voilà, tout, tout le travail n'est pas fait comme on le voudrait, mais c'est des défis à, à relever. Et surtout, les choses à ne pas faire. Nous, comment on a réglé les problèmes du quartier on s'est pris à la fin, mais nous avons fait la délimitation avec l'Agence nationale de statistique et de démographie qui nous a donné les points géographiques des quartiers pour pouvoir avoir une meilleure délimitation. Ça, on l'a fait à la fin, il fallait le faire au début pour être sûr que les gens sont dans les, dans les, bons, dans les bons quartiers parce que c'était fait par quartier. Voilà. Merci. Thank you, Demba. Over to you, Lauren. Sure. In the interest of time, um, I answered this question in the chat in English, and I tried to translate it with Google Translate in French. So I hope it's something that's legible. But um, I'll, I'll just pick one thing that I mentioned, which was related to mistakes um, in urban environments. And I think the, the chief mistake is just to assume that the same interventions from rural contexts will apply and will be attractive in urban environments. And um, I wanted to take that one step further just to note that there was one of the questions in the Minty poll that showed that uh, some programs tend to experience high degrees of dropouts, high degrees of attrition in programs. And this is very common in urban contexts. And the main reason for that is because people have many other options and many other opportunities. And because very often programs that are adapted in urban areas don't necessarily consider some of the constraints that face people in terms of their time, in terms of distance they have to cover. Judy was talking about congested urban environments that people have to travel through to be able to access trainings, to be able to have a coach or a mentor visit them, all of these types of things. And many urban programs don't really factor that into the core design element of the program at the outset. And it's usually a mistake they make and then learn later, we need to change the time, we need to change the location, we need to create greater flex flexibility around access to some of the interventions for populations because they're not necessarily always concentrated in a slum or an informal settlement or so forth. They might be spread across the entire city. They might be in different environments where they can't necessarily access some of those services quite easily. Um, and then the other thing I would mention is, you know, another reason you see high degrees of attrition is when the types of economic opportunities that you're providing people don't necessarily um, hold up to the other opportunities that they may have been provided before. So you might be trying to move them out of um, less secure informal uh, informal work opportunities onto more secure formal wage opportunities and so forth. But if they find that more convenient for the previous engagements that they had, if they find that they are able to build their network more because they continue to operate in an informal setting or because they're able to have greater degree of control over their work by doing informal work, et cetera, that transition can be very hard. So again, it's thinking about how you assess the needs of that population at the outset, but also how you don't assume that the that because that they have access to this program or this set of benefits, that it's going to outweigh the other opportunities that they might be able to engage in in an urban context. Thank you. Thank you. Those were very interesting insights. Judy, would you like to share your insights from an urban planner's and policymaker's perspective? Yeah, just super briefly, I would say um, one of the key challenges really is um, getting different levels of government to work together. Uh, you know, it's amazing to me how often uh, we come to work in a country and, you know, there might be a national level program or policy and then a state level and then you get down to the city level and and then within the city, there are many municipalities, especially in some of the large cities with large metropolitan areas. And there's just a, a lack of communication. And obviously this hinders program implementation, um, the interpretation of, of specifications for a specific program, the design of programs. Um, there are a lot of challenges I've seen, for example, bus routes that go within a city environment so again, they might cross a municipality line, they get to the end of the uh, municipality and the bus line stops and people have no other access to transport. 
because the municipalities aren't working together. So for me, I think it's these institutional constraints that are huge um, and very, very, very difficult to, to address. Um, and it, you know, it calls for a lot of coordination, collaboration, and um, the, the, it's not always so easy. Let me stop there, thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you to all the wonderful panelists for your complimentary, but also distinct insights on the challenges and opportunities of economic inclusion in urban areas. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the participants for joining us. We do want to hear from you. Please, can you, before you leave and move on to the next, your next session for the day, please could you fill out the evaluation? Um, it should be popping up on your screen now, but essentially just two questions. How would you rate this session? Please choose from one poor to five excellent. Um, and the second question, I will use this material and ideas from this session for my future work in this area. Please choose one from strongly disagree to five strongly agree. And in the chat box, you should see the, the link to your next session. Thank you so much for joining us. We will share the presentations with you uh, shortly. Thank you. And thank you very much to the three